Hey, Vetfolio Voice listeners, it's Dr. Cassie. We have a few extra special episodes coming up. And why are they extra special? Well, first of all, because they were recorded face-to-face, which is always so much fun. I love the opportunity to record in studio. But also because they were recorded in what I have lovingly deemed the fishbowl. So what is the fishbowl? Some of you may already be familiar with it if you were at VMX, but Vetfolio Voice had a recording booth on the expo floor where we could sit in the middle of everything and record these episodes. And I'll tell you, at first, I was a little intimidated by the idea of being in a glass booth in the middle of the expo hall for everyone to see, but I really ended up loving it because not only was I able to talk face-to-face with the person I was having the discussion with, But we were able to connect with our audience in a really different way too. I mean, being amidst everyone in such a massive conference, we had people coming up and waving. Some people were making faces at us and a few people took pictures. It was just a way to connect what we were saying with our audience in in a really different, really special way. I was as shocked as the next guy that I ended up enjoying it as much as I did. So first up in the fishbowl was Amy Newfield. Amy has a course on Vetfolio that was released just before VMX called Lead Like a Unicorn. And in this episode, in that course, and in the books that she's published, she addresses a common conundrum in VetMed, which is the transition from a clinical role into a management role. Unfortunately, this is kind of something we see in our field, and those who are thrust into these roles aren't always adequately prepared to take on the leadership and management responsibilities that they require. Amy had this experience herself, which led to some burnout, which she talks about in this episode. She used that experience to help create some learning material for those of us in the field who may find ourselves in similar positions to help us navigate it and give us the foundation we need to be good, quality, and effective leaders. Amy is the owner of Veterinary Team Training. After starting her career in general practice, Amy found her passion in emergency medicine and went on to obtain her veterinary technician specialist, VTS, in emergency and critical care. Amy's new focus is on team leadership and development. After obtaining a master's in management and leadership, Amy published her best-selling and gold medal winning book, Oops, I Became a Manager, which focuses on creating happy veterinary teams. Her second book, Oops, My Team is Toxic, was released in 2022 and focuses on the steps it takes to reshape your team and change your culture. She lives in Massachusetts with her wonderful furry kids where you can find her eating chocolate, running in the woods, competing in agility, and diving in the ocean. If you enjoy this episode, she can be reached at vetteamtraining at gmail.com. Hi everybody, thanks for tuning in. I am here on the expo floor in our in our lovely recording booth with Amy Newfield, who has a whole lot of things that you heard in her bio, but most recently has released this amazing course called Lead Like a Unicorn. So Amy, thank you so much for joining me. Oh my goodness, thank you so much for having me. It's my honor, so thank you. I, I'm, I, this is exciting. It, it is, it is. This is such kind of, it's kind of a surreal experience. It There's is, like yeah. People making faces. And yeah, they're walking by us. It's yeah. it's an odd and, and strange and wonderful experience all at once. I, I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Well, I'm going to I'm going to dive right in with the big questions right. if that's okay yeah, with you. Yeah, absolutely. We talked about part of some of the inspiration between your passion for leadership has to do with your own burnout experience. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I my very first experience with burnout, I didn't even know I was burnt out. I just thought it was normal to be angry and go to work, you know, kind of really disliking what I was doing and being, you know, thinking I was the only person who could do everything and just constantly working 50 to 60 hours a week. And um, at that point, I had oops my way into my first leadership role by just saying yes to everything everything, which is literally the title of my first book, Oops, I Became a Manager, because I just said yes to everything. They said, can you do inventory? I said, sure, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll order stuff. And then they said, can you do the schedule? I was like, yeah. And then can you actually interview somebody? I've been in an interview, therefore I must know how to interview. I will do it. I had really no clue of what I was doing. And this hospital was a great hospital, but after like two, two and a half years in this management role, I felt like I was the only person doing absolutely everything 
And um, I left that hospital on good terms, but I remember being so angry, going home, telling my friends how, what a terrible job I had. I felt underappreciated and undervalued and just feeling really crispy and my friends saying things like, we're tired of you complaining about your job all the time. And then about a decade later, I had some self-reflection and I looked back and thought, I never asked for help. I didn't ask for assistance. I didn't say no. At no point during that job did I say, I can't take another thing on. Like I can't do everything for this hospital. I just kept saying yes, yes, yes. And it started to really reframe my mindset that burnout, yes, is definitely on the ownership of the practice to create a healthy and happy environment, but it's also on the ownership of the person to accept responsibility that I'm feeling crispy, I'm angry every single day, and I need to do something about it. And I think too many of us walk around thinking that cynicism and anger is normal and it's it's just not. So yeah, that kind of led me into eventually wanting to dial in my own leadership skills, go back, get a master's in leadership and management and just kind of put pen to paper. So there we are. <laughs> Amazing. I think you come from a really unique perspective in that way to say, hey, you know, you're really good at being a technician. Can you manage now? And, and that happens so much. So you having that experience that we know so many people have and then being able to you know have a master's degree where where you have training now in leadership and translate that experience back to help others I, I think is really unique and really special and really cool yeah thank you so much yeah I absolutely enjoy the cultivating of people and the culture and the leadership it's just um, something I never thought I would have a passion for but it, it truly is a passion project at this point so yeah yeah, yeah. I actually, can we dive into the masters a little bit? Because when it comes to leadership, like I love the idea of, of having that formal education in leadership, which I know is probably a lot of what's inspiring your courses. And so can you tell us about, you know, what inspired you to get a master's and, and what that experience was like? Yeah, I guess I would have to say that at heart, like many people, I'm a geek and I'm a nerd. And so I'm proud of it. Um, and when I want to learn something and want to dive into something, I'm passionate about it. I just want to know everything. Thing. And for me, you know, I spent probably about 15 years with a, a lot of different management, um, you know, uh, opportunities. But then I found myself going, I want to actually say that I am a manager. And so I dove into, you know, kind of a master's based program. And I thought, do I want an MBA? Or I found a school that had this master's in management and leadership. And I thought, that's really what I'm passionate about. Like the financial piece of running a hospital is important, but to be honest, it's never been my jam to focus on the finances. Sure. I really wanted to dive into the people and the organizational structure. So I went and, and tackled it. I love the, the program. It was great. and. Um, came out knowing so much more and obviously utilized it to create courses and stuff like that and just want to share and give my knowledge. But uh, I know I'm very fortunate in having being able to afford the opportunity to go back to school. So it was great. Weird experience going back to school as an adult in your 40s, but it's OK. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And now, you know, you're doing so much good with that, that education and really making it available to, to other people as well. I love that you touched on that that internal locus of control to say, you know, we have to take responsible as individuals as well as understand that there are circumstances that, that lead to burnout, but what can we do about it? What can we do to, to help ourselves in this situation? Can we can we flip that a little bit? Because, you know, like we talked about, it is so common for people to end up in roles that they're not prepared for. What responsibility does the organization have to the individual? Yeah, so organizations, you know, whether or not you're a single owned hospital or you're all the way owned by a big company, you all have responsibilities to provide a healthy workplace environment in which the team has psychological safety. And so we want the team to feel like they can voice concerns, hey, listen, get feedback in a healthy and constructive manner. And too many of our hospitals right now, we've got so much toxicity that teams are afraid to talk to each other. Technicians are afraid to talk to doctors. There are doctors who are afraid to talk to technicians. CSRs are pretty much afraid to talk to most of the team because they're afraid they're going to get their head snapped off and it's very unhealthy and all of that terrible communication it has to be fixed by leadership to say we're this is the environment in which we're going to fix it so that people can feel like they can talk to each other and share ideas and not be criticized and not be gossiped about or bullied or any of those things so that is really kind of the top down that it, it, you know from a leadership structure you got to make sure your team is is behaving behaving and being like unicorns. And if they're not, we have to educate that team. But then it's also that ownership on that person to say, 
I don't like working here because this team is miserable, bringing their concerns to their leadership, trying to, you know, be the best version of themselves and not adding to the toxicity. Um, that's the other fold of that, that entire process. So it's complicated, but we want to make sure our leadership is having a good, healthy wellness plan. And the wellness plan needs to be an active plan. There's too many people who write, oh, here's my wellness plan. And it's great on paper, but if it's not living and breathing, there's no point to actually creating a wellness plan. So yeah. I love that. Yeah, so really being being proud of your clinic culture. What does it mean to lead like a unicorn? Yes, absolutely. So I am a child of the 80s, which is perfect because we're obviously at the VMX conference celebrating four years and the focus is on the 1980s here. So I'm loving all of the references and I saw Miss Pac-Man walking around the convention Amazing. center. It, like it's so cool. And so I am definitely a child of the 80s. And in the 80s, the unicorns were huge. In fact, somebody came up to me yesterday and was like, I loved Rainbow Bright. It, yes. all, some of you immediately had the song in your head like I do right now. Oh, yeah. Bo Bright. See so I won't sing. I'm not yeah. a singer. Yeah. yeah. See yeah. the shiny. Yeah. <laughs> um, so total child of the 80s. Like absolutely loved it. If you want to see um, Tom Cruise in a light you've never seen, the legend, movie legend, you should check that out. You will okay. view him in a way you've never seen Tom Cruise before. <laughs> he is super young and there's a unicorn in that movie. And so. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. You definitely have to go check it out. So for me, like a unicorn was kind of this rare, magical, wonderful creature and it's hard to find. And as a kid, I think I knew that they, you know, were kind of mythical and probably didn't exist, but I also believe they did exist. And so for me, I would always like look around trees and try to find the unicorns and stuff like that. I think I still hold out hope a little bit. I do think they're, I do think that they're real. I mean, I feel like they must be. And so as I got older, I just never got rid of, I got rid of my unicorn stuff, but I didn't get rid of the unicorn images and the unicorn thought that this was just like the thing that is magical and wonderful. And as I started in leadership, roles to make things fun I would teach my teams about unicorns and I'd say go be a unicorn or have a unicorn moment on the floor what was your unicorn moment and then obviously you know when we think about the course lead like a unicorn it means you're leading to the best of your ability you're that kind of rare person um, leading a team and trying to do amazing work and cultivating nothing but unicorns um, uh, amongst you so yeah that's what it kind of means so just lead like a unicorn it's all things beautiful and wonderful and fantastic it's really powerful imagery like when you say that to say you know that you are that unicorn you know you are that kind of that shining light Mm -hmm. that is creating this positivity for people to follow it's such a great just translation between what you're trying to teach and and I think the unicorn image captures it perfectly thank you so much I appreciate it I actually had people think I was crazy for putting a unicorn on my cover my editor that I hired was like you cannot put a unicorn on the cover that is stupid and dumb and no one will buy your book and I was like I am going to put a unicorn on my cover and that is what I'm doing oh um, so, there you go there and you well go. and I can <laughs> say from experience that there has been a line around the corner yes. for days on end to get these books yes I am glad other people resonate with the unicorn image so yeah I love it I'm having a lot of fun with it and it gets to allow me to be a child again so I give away unicorn stickers I you know tell people to keep on being a unicorn and it's just it's been a lot of fun I'm like really feeling honored and blessed and humbled by the whole thing so it's great Absolutely. Let's real quick talk about your books, um, because like I said, there's been a line for days of, of people wanting to, to get a copy of your books. So tell us a little bit about about those. What are those about? Yeah, absolutely. So the first book, Oops, I Became a Manager, was published in 2020. Um, it just kind of lays the foundation for good leadership, um, hospital organizational structure. I One of the best things that I learned in my leadership courses were, you know, if you don't have good organizational structure, then it's going to be really hard to actually lead a team. And I think veterinary medicine has to start thinking about how they physically structure their hospital, who are the leaders in place and how many leaders we need. And so um, it dives into that. It dives into salary ranges, paying fairly across the board. We should have justifiable reasons for paying every single person in our hospital so that when employees say, why is that person making more? We can say, here's why. And we have exact answers for them. And then creating career paths, not just for veterinary technicians and assistants, but for our CSRs, our client service reps, it should be a true profession where they become a veterinary medical receptionist. And so, and then we just talk about, you know, what it means throughout the 
course of a day to be a really good team member. So it lays this foundation. And then very quickly, I was, I was creating that book. I was also dual creating a second book because I knew that there was so much content, I was never going to fit it in one book. And I knew that the second book needed to be what happens when your team goes awry. So the second book is, oops, my team is toxic. And there's an angry unicorn blowing puffs of red smoke out its nose. <laughs> so what happens when your unicorns get really angry? And what does that look like? How can we have those conversations? How can we drive them from a polite and kind and honest approach, but also making sure that we deal with conflict resolution. And so there's examples in there, communication skills in there, and then also how to coach somebody. I think too many leaders run around putting out fires and they feel like they're just swimming above the waterline. And the reality is, is if we take our time to coach and care about people and have more one-on-ones, we're probably going to have way less fires to put out. So it just kind of puts everything together so that if your team does go awry, you can get it back on track. So it seems kind of reflective of medicine where in my opinion, the way, the way that I like to practice, I, I really like primary care and wellness care uh, it, because it's so much easier to practice preventative medicine than fire engine medicine. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I love that you make that analogy. Absolutely. Because I, one of the things that I make an analogy of in the book is when someone's really struggling, let's say they're really burned out. A lot of leaders just say to that person, you need to stop gossiping or you got to be more positive or stop yelling at the team. And that's all we do. That's not a coaching session. We don't get to the root of the problem, which is why is this person so angry? Because they went into this profession and that what they went into this profession for is still there that hasn't changed it is the pets and the medicine are always there it doesn't matter what job you do or where you go the pets and the medicine are always there and they're always awesome and we always love doing that I don't get burned out from treating patients I get burned out because of all the other things like the team or the workload or you know the clients or all of that that I perceive as being negative and so we have to ask ourselves like wait hang on I can't just tell this person not to do something when I don't even know why they actually are doing it so it's kind of like I make the analogy of we have to diagnose we have to diagnose and then we have to come up with a treatment plan for it and once we kind of treat it more like a medical thing then we can sit down and have a treatment plan and say okay let's talk about this I want to help you I don't want to lose you you know I don't want you to leave the industry so let's come up with a treatment plan for you and and figure it out and that's really what it means to be an amazing you know lead like a unicorn <laughs> gosh and I, I feel like that's something that we can all wrap our heads around of, of a diagnosis and a treatment plan which you mentioned earlier a living breathing wellness plan a mm-hmm. li- living breathing treatment plan what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. I see a lot of um, hospitals right now creating like well-being wellness plans, which is great. CDC has an amazing reference. Um, if you go, go, just Google CDC well-being workplace plan, and they're, they're going to jumpstart you on just kind of laying the foundation. And I'll see a lot of times like hospitals put stuff in writing and then it dies. They'll do maybe, you know, they'll bring in a yoga instructor one time or, you know, I always get the one yoga fix, you know, they bring in that yoga. <laughs> instructor one time. Everything is better now. Yeah, everybody's better. You all did yoga for a day. Yay! And that's not really how it works. It has to be active and always moving and always changing and listening to the team of what they want because some people will resonate with yoga and other people are like, I'm not doing that and that's going to stress me out. But also figuring out from the team how we can help them and also constantly fixing it and editing it and also talking to individuals. Like maybe somebody's going through something they need to change in their schedule, you know, during this time period or we obviously have a lot of moms in veterinary industry and you know when they when they have babies we have to figure out how to support them we can't just put them back necessarily on their old schedules because it might not be conducive to what's going on now so we have to figure out how can we work with them rather than lose them and so well-being plans are about psychological safety do you have great health insurance does everybody know you know about um, the opportunities to potentially have gym discounts or you know can you buy wellness apps you know there's so many great like headspace is an awesome app out there calms another great app out there um can me as an employer pay for that and what does that look like and then it's other smaller things too that people don't think about like keeping your hospital clean and i know that sounds so crazy but you know one of one of the things that broke my heart is i went into a hospital and i said oh where's your break room and they took me to a hallway where there were freezers for the unfortunately their deceased pets and above the freezers were shelves and above those shelves is where they stored their food and then next to the freezers was a small human fridge to put their food in and then in front of the freezers were chairs and they were literally eating their food off the the freezers and i thought this is 
is not your break room, is it? And they said, it is. We don't really have room for a break room. And when we have areas in our hospital where our, we're having our employees eat food off of freezers, and this is obviously a very extreme example, but I know that there's plenty of hospitals that don't have real break rooms and we expect them to relax, but you're eating off of a freezer or you're expecting them to relax and they're in a closet. Like, you know, yeah. we need to start thinking about well-being as, you know, the whole Zen-like mentality of you feel good when it's a nice visual space, when it's a clean space. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity, like if you have a really toxic team and they all of a sudden get a brand new shiny veterinary building, they stop being toxic for a brief while. Yeah. Everything's shiny and wonderful and they've got new equipment and it's so great and they get so excited about it. And then of course they'll resort back to their toxic ways if they don't have any, but that brief while it feels good to be in a new space. And so it's really important that we kind of look at the well-being plan is everything inclusive and that includes all those little details like just being in a good clean veterinary space which people don't think about so start writing down your ideas start asking your team like what would make you feel better to be part of this team and and then certainly go for that and make sure you always evolve it reminds me of talking to my kids when they're you know mom come do this or you know they don't want to help or something do you like living in a clean house well yes I'm like well then clean the house <laughs> yes exactly exactly yeah there's a, there's a lot to be said there's an entire psychological studies out there about people who live in dirty spaces and they are feeling more depressed and more anxious and they get actually ill more and so I mean I believe it's the same with our veterinary teams you know they're going to be more in a negative mindset and struggle to to function in a positive one when it's busy if you're got dirty everything you know it doesn't yeah. feel good so yeah absolutely and the fact that you mentioned that these wellness plans are, are living and breathing I'm assuming that we're, we're checking in and yeah. some sort of time interval and adjusting our plan do you, is there like a do you have a, a plan for that or is that just individual based on the hospital yeah so I would say I recommend quarterly I think that's really key and I love when we can have like a well-being committee um, put a committee together have stakeholders from every team so have have a front desk person, have a veterinary assistant, a veterinary technician, doctor, you know, your medical director, someone from operations, like a practice manager, come together and really, you know, hone in on what it's going to, you know, how we can evolve it and ideas that we can change it. And there's so many wonderful things out there. You know, somebody said they had a five minute nook. They came up to me after one of my lectures just here at this conference and they said, Amy, we have a five minute nook. I said, what is that? And they said, well, you were talking about every, if you can give your brain a rest, for five minutes every one to two hours it actually reduces medical errors in medicine and also reduces burnout and it's interesting you said that because we've had this five minute nook for a couple years we developed it during the pandemic it's actually just a small closet but we got rid of all the stuff in the closet we made it really dim we've got some lighting in there there's fun books they're corny and they're cute and they're made to make you laugh there's a comfortable chair we have bottles of water in there and people can just go in and they draw the curtain and they sit in a quiet space and there's like some zen like music for five minutes and when the curtains close everyone goes oh so and so is in the five minute nook and I go that's an amazing idea I absolutely love it so yeah, yeah there's so many great ideas out there that veterinary hospitals are doing right now so yeah. I feel like I just need that in my life like, yeah absolutely <laughs> I do too I feel like I need a five minute nook in my own house <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah. so thinking about having having this well-being committee being in a clean environment where you're you're proud of the culture and you feel like like you belong and you're doing good work would of course lead to job satisfaction and i would imagine that with increased job satisfaction probably comes decreased turnover yeah, absolutely. I think if we can really focus on coaching individuals, co creating healthy cultures, we're going to see a decrease in, in turnover in our teams and obviously a decrease of turn out of the profession, which unfortunately so many do. And so anytime we can make people feel like proud in their job, proud in their role, and also that their employer cares about them, that's huge. When I, you know, on the busiest days in my emergency hospital, if I knew my manager cared about me, I would go to the moon and back because I had trust that this was just one of those weird one-off days or maybe it was even a one or two week like just slam busy crazy and I didn't 
didn't get burned out because I knew one, if it kept on continuing, my managers got my back and they were going to help me. Sure. And two, I also knew if I was going to struggle and I needed to say something to them, they were going to also support me in that. And so, yeah, absolutely. When we, when we talk about the profession and right now we are all short staffed, I don't know of any hospital who's like, wow, I have so many doctors and so many technicians. I don't even know what to do with them all. That's no, what would that be like? I, nobody has any <laughs> idea what's that like. So I think right now when we're so short staffed, we have to figure out how we can do right by the staff that we have, but also teach them and encourage them to come to us when they are struggling. And I think one of the big things that all veterinary professionals struggle with is guilt. The guilt of having to come to somebody and say, I'm feeling burned out, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I can identify with that. Of you, you never want to say I can't. Yeah, because we're such empathetic people. We came into this industry because we have empathy and we can feel what our pet patients feel. And to say I can't, you feel bad for the rest of the team. You say, Am I letting them down? Oh my goodness, they're, my team's not going to appreciate me. You know, my team's going to think I'm, I'm, you know, a loser or that I'm letting them down or that I'm not working as hard. And especially like for all of us, at some point, we've all got on the text message or I used to get a page so that dates me a little bit <laughs> like wearing a pager um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with the pager it was a little thing that you wore on your waist and it would go beep 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 and you'd look down and there'd only be a phone number and you had to call that phone number weren't there also like weren't there candy pagers yes yes, yes. that's crazy yeah <laughs> so I didn't ever have one of those I had just a really old just school page yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a real pager and it would beep and that was it but you know you look at that phone number or that you know text message coming in like oh my goodness so and so has called out or hey we're really busy can you come in and we all have the same thought which yeah. is I don't know if I can do this but if I don't do this oh my goodness who's gonna who there isn't anybody else I need to say yes and saying yes on occasion when you have the bandwidth to do so it's fine but if you keep saying yes and you, then you start having those thoughts of like oh here they go again isn't there anyone else and you start getting angry about it we have to teach our teams to come to us we have to teach them about the guilt the little liar that lives inside everybody's head to say it's not okay that guilt runs your life you know and and I do I think we we all suffer from it we all just think I'm less than I'm not good as I have to keep go go going and honestly what I've learned and I'm not perfect so I'm going to preference by saying I'm not perfect still learning you know just recently was feeling a little crispy started pulling stuff off my plate and so I catch myself a lot earlier than I used to but I think we all have to sort of like recognize what works for us so that we can take care of ourselves if you can take care of yourself and that sounds like you're being selfish but i promise you it's not then you are going to be a better teammate for the pets and the animals and the clients and your team and and you're just going to be a better version of yourself when you're crispy you don't help yourself and you don't help your team so yeah yeah absolutely yeah then people end up going like why didn't you just stay home right that's exactly <laughs> they're like my, my we would have helped you yeah right. so right we absolutely and so it sounds like, you know, we're, we're talking about taking responsibility as individuals here, um, but also doing some kind of internal check-ins, some yeah. personal check-ins with yourself. And, and I will also plug Headspace. I promise Headspace is not sponsoring this, this podcast, <laughs> but, but I also use Headspace. I love Headspace. And, um, and one of the things I like about it is really sitting there and taking that time. Um, you start to realize what your emotions feel like physically. Yeah. Um, so like you said, I had a similar experience recently where somebody texted me a, a question about their pet. And, and this is part of my practice model. It was perfectly acceptable for them to reach out to me in this way. But I noticed my reaction was like what what do you want now like why is my phone dinging again and I went okay clearly this is too much I need to start drawing some boundaries and like turn on the auto responder for a little bit and you know nothing's nothing's an emergency right this minute um but being able to to feel what I mean, that was obviously like a mental thing but um but to feel that physically and know like oh I have this tightness in my chest and like this is this is early signs of me needing to say no here yeah. um, and, and letting that be okay, which is, is so much easier said than done. Mm -hmm. It is, absolutely. Again, we feel guilty when we say no and then we start beating ourselves up over it. We have to figure out like it's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to talk to yourself and um, to love yourself. And when you figure that out, then um, it does become easier. But I don't think anyone's perfect at it. I haven't met anyone who's like, I have all, I have absolutely mastered boundaries, Amy. I don't know any 
anybody <laughs> who says that. No. <laughs> Everyone's like, I'm still working on boundaries. Me too. We all are. So, but it's important to play an active role in your own well being and your own self care. So, for sure. And I, I like your broad focus here because you're, you know, you're talking about taking care of yourself and, and understanding when you're getting crispy and knowing when, to, when to back away from some of this stuff, which is so important. But I like that you're not losing the focus on the team. Like it's not turning the, the focus completely internally. It's when you start to feel that way, reach out to your team, reach out to your management and have those conversations and, and look for that support. Don't just say, well, well, you're asking too much, so I'm not going to help you anymore. And it is what it is. I mean, it may get to that point if you're not getting the support that you need, but I, I like that you keep that focus on, you know, really having that open communication so that everybody can have their needs met, however that looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's important that not only the employer takes an active role, but the person takes an active role. And when people are really crispy and really angry, they put the ownership only on the leadership team. And they have to look also inward and say, wait a minute, what can I do for myself? And how can I take care of myself? Because while the leadership does have some responsibility, you also have some equal responsibility, if not maybe a little bit more to help yourself. So yeah, absolutely. Well, Amy, this has been an absolutely fantastic conversation. I cannot wait to explore the unicorn course. I want to lead like a unicorn. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful chatting with you and watching all the people out on the floor has been interesting. I know. I know. It's been really fun. I think we had a group like I did. I noticed a here group as point. well. I was like, I feel like a fish in a fishbowl, but it's <laughs> okay. I know. It's fun though. Then people will be even more excited yeah, maybe when this exactly. comes out and say, what were they saying in there? <laughs> exactly. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on. All right, guys, did you enjoy our first fishbowl episode? Because I know I did. Amy, thank you so much for joining me. Everybody be sure to check out Amy's course on Betfolio, Lead Like a Unicorn. Great quality material there. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk, as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day.